Now, ever since Sarah got me on to Audible, I've been listening to books. I don't know if that, I don't know if I've become lazier or more efficient, but I've in, listened to many books. And one of the, the first ones was this one called Live Not By Lies. I actually, it was so good, I actually bought the real thing. And as you can see, I haven't really got that far into it, but um, it was so good I had to actually buy it. This book, it's called Live Not By Lies, A Manual for Christian Dissidents by Rob Dreyer. And it's not a book that, I mean, you've probably heard of it because I've talked about it, but if you don't know me, you probably never heard of it. Um, it's an in-depth study on how communism arose in certain countries and how Christians lived in the midst of that. And I, I always tell people that Live Not By Lies is the book every Christian should read, but probably won't. The reality is, in our social media fake news world, lies have become ordinary. Lies have become the norm. And the come against lies has become controversial today. Uh, Good Friday was the day, we all know, of course, when Jesus was crucified. And there's a lot that can be said about the cross of Christ. You know, we could talk about how at the cross our sins were paid for. We could talk about uh, what atonement is and, and, and how that relates to um, our salvation. We can talk about propitiation. Anybody heard that term, propitiation, what that word means, how at the cross Jesus appeased the wrath of God on our behalf. The cross is like this incredibly deep theological, doctrinal thing. But it's simple enough at the same time, for a young child to understand. You know, my three-year-olds know what the cross is now. And we read the Easter books and they go, the cross, what happened? Jesus died. For what? For my sins. It's pretty simple, but it's very deep. At the cross, Jesus did many, many things. And one of the most important things he did was this. He paid the price to transfer us, those who believe, out of lies to walk in truth. When I got saved, one of the first realities that hit me was, oh my goodness, everything I believed was a lie. <laughs> my whole life was a lie. Everything. Like, I don't, I'm not exaggerating. That's not hyperbolic. Like, everything, I realized everything was, was a lie. I, I was living a lie. So he transfers us out of that, that kingdom of lies into the kingdom of truth, but not just into the kingdom of truth, but to walk in it from now on. So open your Bibles to John 18, and uh, we're going to walk through one of the most crazy scenes in all the Bible, probably in all of history. If I could be somewhere, if I could teleport somewhere, it would probably be to the empty tomb <laughs> moments before that happened. But the second place would be this scene right here in John chapter 18, in verse, uh, starting at verse 33. It says, So Pilate entered the, his headquarters again and called Jesus and said to him, Are you the king of the Jews? Jesus answered, Do you say this of your own accord, or did others say it to you about me? Pilate answered, Am I a Jew? Your own nation and the chief priests have delivered you over to me. What have you done? So here we're introduced to two characters that we know, Pilate and Jesus. Pilate, the Roman governor of Judea, and Jesus, the God-man. In a sense, Pilate was the highest ruling authority in Judea, where Jesus lived. He was given like tremendous authority from Rome to rule over the province. He was in charge. So whenever I read these passages, I, I can't help but ponder really how surreal they are. Like, just think about this. This is crazy. 
if we re- really understood what's happening here in, the, in, in these passages, it would like blow your mind. We have the king of heaven, okay, the creator of all things being questioned, interrogated by a ruler of earth. Think, think about that. Jesus, think of the implications. When you read the Bible, ask, what are the implications of what's happening? Jesus created Pilate, okay? Understand that. He created him. He knit him together in his mother's womb. Jesus did that. That's what the Bible says. He created all things. Jesus is the creator. And the craziest part of all this is Pilate didn't even know it. He's looking at his creator, and he doesn't even know it. But what's even, what's even more astonishing is the fact that the king of heaven had allowed himself to get into a position where Pilate, the created, is questioning Jesus, the creator. So, so how did we get here? Well, when Jesus was kidnapped at night. He, he, was, he was dragged before a mock trial beaten, falsely accused, and now finally he's dragged before the final authority of the land, Pilate. So, so why was Jesus being treated like this? Was he a criminal? Had he done something wrong? He was treated like this for one reason, because he is the truth. And, and when sinful man comes face to face with truth incarnate, they hate it. They hate him. He was hated because he was perfect. And because of the beauty and the majesty of God, when sinful man sees that, it's an abomination to them. When sinful man sees truth and beauty in God, the ugliness and decay of death in them can't stand that. It's too much, it's too glorious. So here he is, the perfect son of God, truth incarnate, standing before the high ruler of earth being questioned. This is ridiculous. So while it's a serious and sort of ominous moment that we see here, uh, the king of heaven clashing with the king of earth, if you will, there's a sort of seasoning sprinkled on this story of banter. We see some back and forth. Uh, a battle of questions. So Pilate asked the first one, hey, are you the king of the Jews? Interesting question. To which Jesus could have easily just said, yeah, I am. And I'm your king too. So bow down and pay homage. But that's not how Jesus answers him. Jesus does what he often does during his earthly ministry. And something that is a powerful tool, which we should use as well, He asks a question of his own. Jesus always answers his questions with questions. He says, do you say this of your own accord or did others say this to you about me? Jesus had an uncanny ability to get to the heart of the matter with like one well-placed, well-worded question. Pilate, was, was, was he really curious or did he just hear about it through the grapevine? Like, Pilate, is this question for real? Do you really want to know the answer? So what does he do? Well, he, he, he answers back with another question. Am I a Jew? <laughs> Am I a Jew, Jesus? I didn't, I didn't arrest you. It wasn't my people who brought you before me. It was your own nation. It was your own chief priests. They delivered you to me. So you tell me, what have you done? There's the issue. There's the issue. Pilate didn't care if he was a king. Maybe he did, but it doesn't seem like he did. The real question is, why have you been brought here? Why are you you here? Why are you wasting my time? It wasn't if Jesus was the king of the Jews. The real issue was, did did you actually do anything to merit this? Because I'm sure Pilate, you know, if Jesus was said, well, actually, no. It's kind of a, a farce. Pilate would have been happy to scourge the chief priests and teach them a lesson. So, 
this question of Jesus's kingship, if there's ever, if it's ever been relevant, which it's always been, it's of urgent relevance today. Pilate asks, are you the king of the Jews? And Jesus knew the way he answered this question was very important because if he asserted, you know, strongly, I am, and I've come to overtake you, then we're in trouble. He's in trouble, right? Because you can't subvert Rome, place yourself above Caesar. That's a no-no. Now, if Jesus just said, well, I'm sort of like, you know, people like me or whatever, Pilate, just get out of here, you know, get out of my face. I don't want to deal with this. Now, did Jesus care to offend Rome? Was he afraid to offend Rome? No, he didn't care. But Jesus was seeking to convey a, a, a more profound truth about who he is. So sure, he could have said, I'm a, I am the king of the Jews, but really, what does that mean? Not just, is he, not just is he the king of the Jews, but Jesus wanted to convey his kingship was different than the kingship of the world. You know, when Pilate heard about kings, they had a certain framework for what a king was. And Jesus wants to convey, what you think a king is, is not what I am. I am a king, but not like you understand what a king is. This is why he answers with the question, well, who told you I was a king? Who told you that? Did someone tell you, or are you just inquiring? The kingship of Jesus is irreversibly linked to the fact that he is the truth. He's not a truth. He's the truth. In Jesus' kingdom, truth reigns. In the kingdom of men, lies reign. And boy, is that ever the case today. (laughs) The kingdom of God on this earth is hated and maligned precisely because it will not bow down to the lies. We will not live by the lies, as the book says. We will not live by the lies. This kingdom that Jesus is king over has a strategy to consume all the kingdoms of men and overcome them all, but it doesn't do it with a sword or, 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 a, or a gun or a tank. The weapon is truth. Pilate didn't need to be worried that Jesus would come with horses and chariots. His weapon is the truth, and, 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 and the truth would do and is doing a lot more damage to the kingdom of lies that Pilate had built his life on than any weapon forged by man could ever accomplish. So Jesus answers Pilate, verse 36, he says, 36 to 37, Jesus answered, my kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, My servants would have been fighting that I might not be delivered over to the Jews. But my kingdom is not of the world. It's not from the world. Then Pilate said to him, so you are a king, Jesus answered. You say that I am a king. For this purpose I was born and for this purpose I have come into the world to bear witness to the truth. Everyone who is of the truth listens to my voice. So Jesus tells Pilate, I'm a king, but my kingdom is not of this world. Pilate's mind was entrenched in the natural. He was a Roman. He was a pagan idolater. He had gods, many gods that he worshipped. But all these gods were of this world. So he couldn't comprehend who the true God was in any meaningful way. So much so that when his own creator was literally standing in front of him, he didn't even see it. Why? Because Jesus' kingdom is otherworldly. Jesus was a king, you know, behind enemy lines, if you will. His kingdom did not belong to the order of this world. His kingdom was transcendent above this world, yet he found himself in it. So Jesus tries to help Pilate understand, using language that's familiar to him. Look, if my kingdom was of this world, okay, My servants would have fought for me, right, to protect me. Pilate knows if a king is attacked, his servants will defend him. Pilate knew he had legions of Roman soldiers. If somebody attacked him, he had an army to protect him. 
You couldn't just waltz in the pilot's house and smack him upside the head. You couldn't do that. So Jesus says, listen, if my, king, if my kingdom were of this world, you and I both know I wouldn't be here. Not, not like this. But here he is, Jesus, the cosmic king of the universe, seemingly important, seemingly defenseless. Jesus is again asking penetrating questions. Jesus is going over his head with the truth of who he really is. They say this, the, the truth is often stranger than fiction. Well, in this case, Pilate had come face to face with the truth, and it was so strange that his mind couldn't even begin to compute what, what, what this was all about. Now, many will ask and speculate, do aliens exist? What do you think? Do aliens exist? Do you think aliens exist? <laughs> Illegal aliens. Anybody? Yes, no, maybe so. I'm asking you to define alien. Okay. <sighs> Aliens exist. They most certainly exist. But, hear me out. Wait, before you leave. <laughs> These aliens don't come from distant planets with sophisticated space vessels and big green heads. These aliens aren't, you know, looking to phone home or, you know, ride a bike over the moon or something. These aliens are you. <laughs> you're an alien if you're a believer. Christians are aliens. Why? Because we're not of this world. What is an alien by definition, right? We asked, you asked about what the, def, the, the definition is, a, a, a living being not from this world, not of this world. Jesus is technically an alien, right? Because he's God and he came here from heaven. <laughs> Jesus is the king of a kingdom that is otherworldly, that naturally it would make sense that those who believe in him are aliens too. The king, kings of this world, are, if you haven't noticed, polar opposites of, of King Jesus. Now, kings of this world, they rule as dictators over their people. They lie to their people in order to gain prominence. They hurt their people in the long term for short-term rewards for themselves and their friends. They sacrifice the greater good of their people for their own personal gain. It's called politics. <laughs> now look at King Jesus, right? Put King Jesus on the ledger, put him on the other side, and compare. Jesus rules over his people, how? In gra with grace and truth. Jesus only tells the truth because he is the truth. He can't lie. It's impossible. And Jesus sacrificed, sacrificed himself for the greater personal gain of his people. That's what makes Good Friday so good, right? You, you might ask yourself, why is it good that Jesus died on the cross. Well, because that sacrifice frees us. It saves us. He sacrificed himself for your good. No other person, no other worldly ruler has done such a thing or would even consider it. The king of heaven humbled himself and died on the cross to save you from sin and death and the lies that shackle us to that inevitability. The truth dove head first into a world of lies. It's like Jesus was in heaven and he just, you know, uh, belly flopped into a bunch of lies. And he knew he, what he was getting himself into. He did it because he knew he would die. It was the plan to save those enslaved by lies so they could be set free into the truth. And the price to free those prisoners was his blood. So Jesus comes and he sheds his blood to transform us all into aliens. And that's why he's standing before Pilate. It was the only way. 
He had to die under the cruel hand of the kingdoms of earth. The Jews, they captured him. They judged him. And although the false witnesses came forward, they found no guilt. The false witnesses, their testimonies contradicted each other. So they were like, oh no, it backfired. We can't, we can't find guilt in him because our, our witnesses aren't on the same page. Because it's lies. I heard somebody say recently, if you just tell the truth, you don't have to remember the lies. Right? So he's standing, Jesus, the truth, now before the king, if you will, of the Gentiles. And he's being judged by him. But look at this. The truth is not phased by the lie. Truth stands on its own merit. It doesn't need to defend itself. The trial of Jesus is proof that if the whole world turned on the truth, the truth will prevail still. The truth doesn't need consensus to be true. Because the truth is steady, immovable, unswayed, it is what it is. God said, remember Moses? He says, what's your name? He says, I am that I am. I just am. I'm true. Always been, always will be. So Pilate says, so you are a king then. Oh, okay. Of course he is. But he's not like any king that Pilate could comprehend. And that's the whole point. That's what Jesus is trying to convey. Listen, I am a king, but you don't get it. You don't understand what kind of king I am because you can't understand what kind of king I am. He just tells him, you say that I am a king. Yeah, yeah, that's true. For this purpose I was born and for this purpose I've come into the world to bear witness to the truth. Everyone who is of the truth listens to my voice. And there it is. There it is. That's why he came. Why did Jesus come, people will ask. He told you pretty, pretty plainly, I came. I was born for this purpose, to bear witness to the truth. And if you hear my voice, you hear truth. Everyone who is of the truth listens to my voice. The voice of truth isn't looking to persuade anyone of its truthfulness. The voice of truth resounds for all to hear, but only those who are of the truth will hear it and obey it. The cross of Christ is like a radio frequency. You know, it echoes through all of time, and only those who've had ears supernaturally tuned to hear its frequency will hear it. It's there. It's always there. But can you pick it up? Do you hear it? Do you hear the voice of truth? This is why the issues of our day are so important. Who is king? Whose voice do you hear today? Rome is telling you to obey it. Rome is saying, don't see your family, close your businesses, only worship how we say you can. And the master says, whom the sun sets free is free indeed. simple. Jesus doesn't have to use many words. Whom the sun sets free is free indeed. End of story. The world is marching off a cliff because they only hear the voice of their master. And when the aliens come and they say, no, no, Christ is king. We got to obey him. That's, a, that's like a declaration of war. But our victorious master stands before the ruler of earth, judged, beaten, ridiculed. And Good Friday communicates that no matter how bad it gets, the kingdom of God will swallow up the kingdom of lies. It's inevitable. It's inevitable. This is why, you know, Christians, some Christians have such, you know, it it sort of irritates me, but I understand because, you know, everybody has moments of frustration, but like Jesus is victorious. And I hear so many Christians saying, well, it's just going to get worse. It's just going to get worse. Okay, maybe, but not (laughs) because it will eventually get better. If if all you think is it's going to get worse, it's going to get worse. Well, then where's the victory? Where's the victory? Jesus could have, you know, standing before Pilate. I mean, that's pretty bad. 
that's a pretty bad position, right? I mean, the king of the universe being judged by a, sin, by a sinner. Jesus could have said, boy, this is only going to get worse. And it kind of did, didn't it? It did get worse. But then it got infinitely better because Sunday came. So sure, it might get worse, but guys, it's going to get better. So how about we just focus on how it's going to get better? Who cares if it's going to get worse? Because it's going to get better, infinitely better. So don't let the fact that things might look bad. Okay. Let me just say this. This isn't in the notes, but I got to say this. Jesus is the Savior, okay? Everybody agrees. If you're a Christian, Jesus is your Savior. But how come we don't believe that? How come when things get bad, we're just like, well, the Bible says it's going to get worse. I thought Jesus was the Savior, though. Doesn't he, it, doesn't Jesus, it, it, doesn't it delight him to save? Isn't God, you know, delighted to save sinners? Isn't he delighted to save you in, in times of trouble? So when we say things like it's only going to get worse, like, we're basically saying, like, God just doesn't care anymore. No, no, like, he's, he delights to save. Look through history, and you'll see when it was the bleakest time for the church, God is the buzzer beater, okay? He waits till the last second, and then shoo, half court, swish, saved. Games won, you rejoice. But as the clock is ticking down, we're looking, we're going, oh, no, we're down by, you know, we're down by two. Oh, we need a three-pointer. They have the ball. It's only getting worse. Revelation is being fulfilled. Everything is the mark of the beast. The Antichrist has come a hundred times already. And then God comes and goes, swish. And you go, oh, thank you, Lord. When really we could have just said, well, God's just going to steal the ball and swish it. So just, let's just wait on the Lord. Like Moses, right? Behold the salvation of the Lord. See splits. God delights to save his people. He will not forsake his church. Anyways... It's only going to get better. Verse 38. And hey, if you die, it gets better. So how can you lose? <laughs> Verse 38. Of course, nobody wants to die, but with Christ, to live is Christ, to die is gain. Lord, give us strength. Verse 38. Pilate said to him, what is truth? After he had said this, he went back outside to the Jews and told them, I find no guilt in him. But you have a custom that I should release one man for you at the Passover. So do you want me to release to you the king of the Jews? They cried out, not this man, but Barabbas. Now Barabbas was a lot, uh, sorry, a robber, a liar. Um, that word robber could also be translated insurrectionist, enemy of the states. So here we have what I believe is one of the most tragic scenes in history. Aside from the fall of man, of course, which led to this. But Pilate asks, what is truth? What is truth? He asks what is truth while the truth was literally staring him in the eyes. That's a tragedy. The tragedy is the answer was right in front of him. The million dollar question, what is truth? And yet this is the question that our whole secular culture is incentivized to undermine. Our culture has to undermine truth or else it doesn't, it can't exist. I remember recently getting into a discussion with a public school teacher. I have nothing against public school teachers. And this is just an anecdotal example of what the culture generally believes. So she was saying that, you know, lockdowns are great and we should just listen to the science. And I said, okay, I'm not against science. So I pressed her, like, what science are you talking about? Tell me what the science is. Well, she just said like, well, the experts say this, the experts say that. I said, okay, but like, what's the proof? She had no answer, no meaningful answer at least. And I said, well, if we're going to talk any further, we've got to understand and have a baseline for what truth is. So I asked the question, what is truth? And she basically said, what's true for you is true for you, and what's true for me is true for me. 
I told her, you know, when I was in school, I wasn't told how to think. I wasn't taught how to think. I was taught what to think. Big difference. I said, you're not teaching kids how to think. You're teaching them what to think. If you're teaching them how to think, then questioning everything would be appropriate. Right? But it's not. Her answer to the question, what is truth, confirmed that that's still true today. Oh, well, we do philosophy. I go, yeah, well, you do it poorly. <laughs> we live in a culture that says truth is relative in one breath. Like, your, tr- like you know, your truth is your truth, my truth is my truth. Okay, well, I reject the science. Well, you're wrong. <laughs> what? How? I thought my truth was my truth. Now you're undermining my truth? You don't even believe what you're telling me. Truth is relative, but then they'll throw pastors in jail if they don't follow their arbitrary rules. Wait a minute, I thought that was his truth. How are you gonna come against his truth? Like you dug yourself into a hole, but they don't care because they have to undermine truth to exist. You can't judge him, but the fact is, they know there is truth. And Pilate was standing before the truth, and the world had come against the truth, and they hated the truth, and they hated the truth so much that the whole world, both Jew and Gentile, conspired against him to kill him. Your truth is only your truth if it doesn't come against my truth. But the truth doesn't care. Jesus Christ comes against all lies without compromise. This is why Jesus was rejected by the world, because he is the truth, and the world is full of dead men with lies. John 8, Jesus was having a discussion with the religious rulers of his day, and after some back and forth, Jesus says this, which is highly offensive. John 8, 44. Okay, let me just find it here. He says, you are of your father, the devil. Remember, he's talking to religious folk. And your will is to do your father's desires. He was a murderer from the beginning and does not stand in the truth because there is no truth in him. When he lies, he speaks out of his own character for he is a liar and the father of lies. But because I tell the truth, you don't believe me. Which one of you convicts me of sin? If I tell the truth, why do you not believe me? Whoever is of God hears the words of God. The reason why you don't hear them is that you are not of God. Yikes. <laughs> That's, those are strong words. Offensive words. True words. Loving words. Those outside of Christ, he tells us, are the children of the devil. Oprah tells you, we're all children of God. Jesus says, you are of your father, the devil. (laughs) And you speak lies because that's the native language of your father. You know, as a father, I've done a decent job, I think, of teaching my children how to speak English. They're still young and they're learning, but we're getting there with the help of Sarah, of course. Um... I teach my children how to speak our native language. The devil teaches his children how to speak his native language. Lies. That's what Jesus is saying. You grew up with your papa, the devil. He's taught you his, he's taught you his native language. It's lies. So all you know is lies because that's the only language you know. You need to learn a new language. But you can't because you don't hear the word of God. And you can't hear the word of God. The devil's a liar. That's his language. That's his native tongue. Therefore, his children naturally love the lies and hate the truth. So what is truth? It really isn't that complicated. Jesus is the truth. And after asking this question, Pilate walks out. Oh, what is truth? And he just leaves. And Jesus is like, should have let me answer because I'm the truth, you know? But he didn't, he didn't even have to because Jesus has already said in the same book, John, I am the way, the truth, and the life. You know what, John, or what Jesus says in John 8? It's like the same thing he says to Pilate. It's the same message. 
Pilate didn't think much of Jesus and his incoherent ramblings about some alien kingdom being the voice of truth. You know, seemed a little crazy or whatever. But, like, it's not a crime. Being, being a crazy Jew is not a crime. And Pilate understood that. So, he goes back and he says, all right, I've interrogated the man. I find no guilt. A little crazy. Has some crazy ideas, but not a crime. So, I'll tell you what. At the Passover, you know, we have a custom, we have a deal. I release a prisoner to you to appease, you know, have a good relationship. So should I give you, here's your choice, king of the Jews? Now, that was a, a, a sort of, uh, I believe he said that in a mocking tone. Because here are the Jews saying, this guy is saying he's this, he's saying he's the king, he's no king, you know, uh, do something with him. And then he comes out and says, do I give you the, your king? You want your king back? Huh? He's mocking him. And they say, no, give us Barabbas. What do I do with the king? Crucify him. What has he done? It's not in John, but if you read, I think, in Luke, he, well, what has he done? He says, crucify him. Okay. He washes his hands, says, crucify him. The king of heaven was rejected. When given the choice between truth or lies, the world will always choose the lie. And not only that, but they will not just choose the lie, but they'll seek to kill the truth. Today, lies are so embraced that the truth is a lie. And lies are the truth. Boys are girls. Girls are boys. Men marry men. Women marry women. They say murdering babies is a choice. It's like health care. Murdering babies is health care, apparently. Like, am I insane or something? You know, female empowerment is to become more masculine. What? What's wrong with being feminine? God made you that way. Embrace it. Debt is wealth. That's what they tell you. Debt is wealth. You want to be rich? debt. Print more money. The, the, the whole system is built on debt, and they're telling you it's wealth. It's a lie. This is my favorite one. Well, anyways, to stay healthy, you want to be healthy, stay home, eat fast food, and live in fear. That's not healthy, by the way, if you didn't know. <laughs> And then, and, then, and, then, and then the father of all the lies, the truth, is whatever you want it to be. It feeds them all. It feeds all the lies. It makes every lie legitimate. Well, I'm, a, I'm biologically male, but I identify as a female. Well, that's not true. No, because the truth is whatever I want it to be, right? So lies can't exist. We're, we're living in a world so steeped in lies that the truth is an anomaly. Hence why Christianity is so hated, so persecuted, because Jesus disrupts the kingdom of lies with a single word and he just destroys it. The cross of Christ is that moment when the truth and the lies collided. When the truth, you know, voluntarily put himself under lies and let lies destroy him so that he could overcome it. The truth is rejected by the rulers of the earth, condemned to die, in order that he might save all those who hear his voice. So I've seen The Passion of the Christ many times. I'll probably watch it tonight again. But the first time I saw it, I remember being especially thrown off by Jesus' demeanor. It, it confused. I wasn't a Christian when I first saw it. But I was like, man, this is weird. So he's kidnapped in the night, right? If you've seen the movie, you know he's beaten to a pulp standing before tri tribunals and false witnesses are coming forth and they're saying he did this and he did that and then the next guy comes and contradicts the first guy and, and, and he's just standing there. Say, what do you say, Jesus, to these accusations? And I'm, I'm ready for Jesus to just drop the bomb. He said nothing. Just stands there, head down, just quiet. Why is he so calm? <laughs> while, while he's being accused of false things. Why is he so calm when people are lying about what he said and did? 
The whole journey to the cross, we see the truth standing before accusations of lies, but he doesn't even try to vindicate himself. The truth allowed the lies to be propagated. Why? Why is he so calm? Why, why doesn't he try to fight back? It's simple. <laughs> because Jesus knew the truth. Jesus was the truth. And lies were just a distraction. The truth doesn't need to vindicate itself. The truth stands on its own merit. It doesn't need to fight for itself. It already won. He knew well what his mission was. He, he had spoken all the truth he had to. Everyone knew what he said. It was very public. Nothing more could be said that he didn't say already. So this was the moment when the truth had to be rejected, and he knew it. And by being rejected and dying at the hands of liars, he would redeem and pay for the sins of his people. And so he sheds his blood. He pays for our sins. He's rejected for the lie so that we might be accepted by the truth. So, how then can we continue to walk in lies? When Jesus died to bring us to the truth. Living in the truth won't be easy in a world of lies because the truth confronts the lies and the lies which the world has built its kingdom on they need the lies to continue for the thing to stand. The truth of Jesus threatens the kingdoms of the world, but if we hear his voice, we walk in the truth. And not many of us are pastors or preachers. Not many of us will lead crusades into the darkness, to, you know, darkness to pillage hell and populate heaven. But all of us can do one powerful thing. Live not by lies. We can all do that. It doesn't have to be grand and, um, you know, dramatic. We can all reject the lie. We can all not participate in it. That's all it takes. That's all Jesus is asking of you. Live not by lies. Jesus didn't shed his blood on the cross so we can live lies. He died so that by his blood we could come completely out of the web of lies to walk freely in the truth. That's why he died. So, the team will come up and lead us in another song, and then we'll remember the Lord's cross with uh, our communion meal. But I finish with these words from the Lord, found in John chapter 8, verse 36. Jesus says, So, if the Son sets you free, you will be free indeed. Father God, we thank you for sending Jesus to die. We thank you for the cross. We thank you for saving us from the lies. Thank you for revealing the truth, Lord. Um, we need you so, so desperately. So receive our worship, Lord, as we remember what you've done for us. In Jesus' name, amen. As they're singing...